round eight, Assen, always a great event, great weekend. We do miss the Saturday race, I think. I don't know. I, I, how long ago was it we went to Sundays at Assen? I, I, I always liked the point of difference, like the oldest you know, Grand Prix at the cathedral, the most famous venue, run on a Saturday. It's different, isn't it? But anyway, maybe you guys like just everything being on a Sunday. That's fine as well. But I would, I, I always enjoyed the Saturday. A bit different, isn't it? And it's also a good one. If you just have a spare of thought for our MotoGP loving friends, I used to be one of them over in the complete wrong time zones uh, for European Grand Prix racing. And you finally had one where you could stay up late on a Saturday night and not worry about getting to work on Monday. Stay up to whatever time you want. Have a few beers while you watch the race. You never get to do that on a Sunday night in Australia. You've got to work on Monday morning. Anyway, I always thought it was good. You know, for all our friends in the Asia Pacific time zone. This week's been a whole thing. I'm, I'm just going to get this recorded, get this out as quick as I can, and we'll move on to Saxon Ring after this. I only got around to watching the races yesterday anyway, so it's it's been it's been a week. All right, so let's get into it. Pecco is at his insane best. And when you see him like this, I mean, who are we talking about here? Duan, Lorenzo, name your legend. Pecco's there at the minute, uh, just in this little recent spell of form. And if you can keep it going. Uh, untouchable sprint and Grand Prix Sunday. Topped every session. Actually, can I just start this week? We're going to talk about MotoGP Fantasy, which I always sometimes forget. And I don't always talk about fantasy. But this week, I feel like I've been done in by the... Uh, by the website, all right, because just after practice on Saturday, right before qualifying, I was like, good, I'll make my changes. I had Mark in there, so I was like, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about keeping Mark, that's why I waited. And then I was like, no, 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 I'm going with Martin. Boosted Peko, and I was like, yes, sweet, uh, great. Hit confirm, it swapped him, and then when I refreshed the page, it had swapped him back, and it said I missed the lockout. I was before, the session hadn't started. And so I've ended up going into this week with like Pedro as a gold rider, Mark as a silver, and I don't know. Was it the app's done me in? The website's done me in there. Like the session hadn't started, I hadn't missed the lockout. It just didn't accept my trade, and I had to do it a few times. And then when it did do it, and then I refreshed the page, it had reverted back. Not happy. Whoever runs that. All right. Anyway, Pecco was great. You should have had him boosted. I would have done, but it didn't let me. Why Martin Valent uh, effort? Just to keep him within an arm's length, I suppose. Not even, he didn't actually, did he? But he just at least was second for the whole weekend. And this is where you look at Pecco, as I said, absolute dominance. Pick whichever legend you want to compare him to when he's in this kind of mood. And look, we're going into this point here where you're looking at Pecco and being like, I've never seen him this kind of unbeatable. But he's still not winning the world championship. And it's just how many points he gave away early on. So is this going to be one of those things? Let me know. Where do you stand with Pecco? Is he one of those guys that like, look, he had a bad start to the season. He's just going to do this. Or, like, he's not going to win every race. Maybe he will not win almost every race the way he's riding. And then he'll catch and pass Martin points wise. And then it will just keep building and building and building. Or have we seen with Pecco in the past that when he gets into a position where it's like, well, now you're definitely going to win the world championship. You are the form guy. Everything's going for you. You just have to keep winning these. Like you've just like you've just been winning these like they're nothing. And then that's when he has issues. You know, he'll have a crash from the lead or he'll have a really dodgy weekend or he'll do something just completely stupid. Which one is which Pecco are we going to get as he overtakes Martin in the in the title race here? Which Pecco is he just going to keep being chase Pecco where he, like as he's chasing down a title lead, he's unbelievable or is he going to revert to Championship leading Pecco when pressure's... Well, not pressure, but when it's expe the expectation is from here that you just build your lead and just go and win comfortably in the World Championship. Is he going to get to that point where in the past we've seen him almost... I always take a picture late, but struggle a little bit. Struggle. Let me know which one you think we're going to get. But I thought my team was really good. Did everything he could this weekend because you weren't pe beating Pecco there. Mark had an interesting weekend. Obviously, had his off in the sprint. And I, for a hundred, I can I just say I saw that coming a mile away. That was always going to happen in that race. I just don't know why. I felt like Mark just had that chaos to him. I, I don't know what it was, but it just felt like he was just pushing a lot to just be there. That's what it felt like to me. And you just knew that this, like, he was just going to be. It was going to be one of those ones. And it went on to have a chaotic Sunday with his tire pressure issue. And good on him because the way he rode, rode to make a mockery of this tire pressure thing was perfect because he put a spotlight on it like he's just sitting there going no i can't be in fresh air i can't be in clean air here. there could be no cold air touching this tire otherwise i'm gonna fall foul of these regulations and so he had to sit in and then as soon as he got to the front of that group he was like i actually can't stay here waved digi through who had a good weekend as well waved digi through and just had to sit there 
when you just feel like he probably was just the, probably going to come third, if he was allowed to just lead off that group and just go and, you know, I don't know if they set the tie pressure because they were expecting him to be maybe tucked in behind Martin or something. And when he got gapped by Martin and Peko, he was like, well, I've got to sit behind. I've got to sit fourth now. Was it Digi ran wide when he was following him? Or maybe it was Mav at that point. Ran wide, Digi maybe. And then he couldn't overtake him. He just sort of like, oh, I'll sit up then. <laughs> Hilarious. And just, like I said, made a mockery of the whole thing. Um, and I know that these rules are in place for a reason. They wouldn't do it if there wasn't a good reason to do it. But the solution obviously can't be this. Can we just, like, what's this thing with, like, Michelin where it's like, oh, uh, or tyre. I don't know anything about tyre production and design. So if you work for a tyre company or you know you have intricate knowledge of tyres and rubber, let me know. When this looked like it could have been an issue, like a couple of years ago, like when I say a couple of years ago, I mean at the start of last season, they were like, well, we need to introduce these tyre pressure rules. You've had 12 months since that point to develop a new tyre. Is it not that easy? You can't develop a new MotoGP tyre in 12 months? I mean, maybe you can't. Maybe maybe I'm asking too much here. Because uh, we got into this season and we still have the same, we need to make the same precautions with pressures and things like that, that we have to like discipline people for dropping below certain pressures, whatever. But when this first came up, was there not, is there not time to redevelop a tyre to be like, we don't have that problem? I don't know. I don't, like I said, I'm not technical on tyres. I'm not even that technical on the bikes themselves, to be honest. I have a little bit of a working knowledge on how things work. When, I've watched, when you watch off MotoGP, like I have over the years, you sort of just you understand certain aspect to a degree, a basic working knowledge on how things work. Tyres, I'm not good at that at all. Not good at all. So maybe I'm well off the mark here, but like surely we had time to just, just, just make a different thing. Just make another one. I don't know. I could be completely off the mark. Tell me if I've overstepped here. But 12 months is a long time. Mark, yeah, had a real chaotic weekend with that. And look, was unlucky. Apparently the, the pressure limit, he was like 0.1 under it or whatever. It's cost him 16 seconds, so he's finished 10th. It, it, it kind of is what it is. And again, it's one of those things where sometimes if I'm being critical, I'd be like, well, why wouldn't you just pressure him? It's like, I know you pressured him to be riding behind someone, but why anyway who else was good bastianini had a fucking great sunday i just still think there's a lot there with him and i think it's a big loss for ducati i know they had no way of keeping him there's no way of keeping him it's a big pickup for ktm this because this guy just has a way of just for some reason we can't seem to see a replication of what he was doing at grassini where he could win races i know he had like when he was at grassini it was like win or he was like 15th right uh, or at least challenge for the win so he's not quite at that point yet, but he's got a more solid kind of consistently running in top fives, if not on the podium now. So like a fourth on in the sprint, and he was making his way through again from deeper in the field. Third here where he came from the way back. There's a lot there to like. He just needs to be, he's just not on that level with Martin and Banyaya, where they're away at the front at the start and then manage. If he can get away following them two in third, even if he's like loses a couple of seconds, two, three seconds to them, over the early laps, you know, he can start to bring that back, but he just isn't, he's, he's seventh or eighth after the early laps, ninth, and then ends up third or fourth when he needs to be third or fourth in the early laps and end up challenging at the end. It's just a, there's a small thing there that he needs to find. It's not much, but he could be elite, but it's not much there to find, but it, he does need to find a little bit. But Digi had a good weekend, Vinales, Binder. Alex Marquez was really solid all weekend. I really like Raul Fernandez this weekend. And I'm rushing through this a little bit this week. I'm not going to go into too much depth about everyone because I just want to get this video out and just move on to Saxon Ring. The video will be better after Saxon Ring, don't worry. <laughs> okay, let's uh, talk the old Japan Cup before we get into a bit of housekeeping for MotoGP. Just the little things that have, news that's popped up in the last few days since the race. Uh, but let's talk uh, the old Japan Cup first. Big win here for, I say big win. It's finished one position ahead of Zarco here. But Fabio Quattro, another 10 points in the old Japan Cup. This is going to be abs. This is going to get ugly for these other guys because he's a, he's a long way ahead already. He's on fifty nine points now with that win. Zarko was second. Takanakagami third. Marini fourth. Me and Rins both didn't finish. We're going to talk about Rins in a second. Which leaves in the All Japan Cup. Fabio Quattro fifty nine points. Zarko moves to second on thirty one. Rins drops to third on twenty seven. Taka moves up ahead of Mir on twenty five points. Mir twenty four and fifth. Marini goes up to 20 points, still sixth though, chasing down Mir. If Rins is out for a few races here, like I said, we'll talk about that. Uh, maybe Marini can get ahead of him. We never know. And Bradle's still seventh on three points from his wild cards. And I, surely he's racing in Germany. 
So he might pick up some more points there. Also racing in Germany, Remy fucking Gardner. Get in, lad. Now, this is because of Rins being sent to heaven on the first lap, first quarter, pretty much, uh, of the of the Grand Prix. And when I say sent to heaven, he's not dead. He came back down. Uh, he just went all the way up there for, for a second. That was massive. It was massive. And he has fractured, I think it's an, an ankle and a wrist or something like that. So he'll be out for, I don't know how long now. It's either one of those ones where sometimes you see with MotoGP riders are like, yeah, broken leg, strap it up, lad. I'll be back the next race. Or it could be one of those ones where it's like, look, just I need to get to the end of the season. Let's just miss a couple of races here and just let things heal a little bit um, before we go flying off the handlebars again. Uh, so Remy Gardner is going to come in to replace him. And I think this has opened up an interesting conversation where we're all looking at like where, who's going to end up where Pramac undecided or unsigned on riders. Because I think Yamaha is going to have a big say in who ends up on the Pramac because it is two factory bikes that I think we're told they're going to get. And it's going to be a huge part of the development of the Yamaha moving forward. But I'm, I'm sure they'll be talking with Pramac and they'll be, I think at the end of the day, it might be Yamaha's call who gets on that bike with it being two factory bikes. Just my instinct. I don't know if that's actually the case. I know a lot of teams run with like, we'll pick one, you pick one kind of deal. I think this will be a really in-depth conversation, Pramac and Yamaha to decide on something together. But I think final say, I think it's going to go to Yamaha. But anyway, the reason I'm saying this is, you know, Remy Gardner's entered the, entered the chat here. Now, I, don't, I still think it's hugely unlikely that he'd get the ride, but I think it's an interesting thing that they'd take an opportunity to put him on the bike because I think they probably want to have a look at him because it's easy to chuck like Cal on here. Get him on there. We know he's reliable. We know he's solid. He's the test rider. He's there to give us the feedback, whatever. We're developing a bike. Probably is smart to put Cal on the bike if you can. Although, is he, is he, is he injured? Is that why he missed his last one? Is he still injured? I don't know. I think this is a good opportunity for him to have a look at Remy. And if you look at some of the other names that are in the hat, you know, you've got some Moto2 guys. You've got guys like Miguel Oliveira. You've got guys like Ralph Fernandez. I think they would probably be looking at because he's really turned his form around. And if you're looking at Oliveira as a former Grand Prix winner and an experienced guy, you have to be looking at Raul. And if you're looking at Raul, you have to be looking at Remy because I'm not convinced that, like, if Remy had stayed in MotoGP this whole time, I think he'd be doing as good as Ralph Fernandez is, if not better. I thought he was probably the better of the two when they were together, just off memory, could be my Australian bias. And I still think there's a lot there with Remy. So I think they will be considering him. I think he's a dark horse to get this job. And I think this is why they're throwing him on. I think they really want to have a look at him. So interesting times ahead. In other rider signing news, Alicia Spargaro, in what could be Honda's most important signing going into next season, full-time riders, whatever, but this could be more important. Alicia Spargaro to ride as the test rider, to bring his knowledge to the team and to, I'm sure, ride a few wild cards for him. Um, he's going to be doing a lot of testing on that bike. He's going to do a lot of testing on that bike. So, yeah, that's all the news covered, I think. I might have missed stuff, but I've not really been on it this week. So let's uh, move on to Moto2. And this was great this week. Moto2, this was awesome. Ayagura, great win. Great win for him. Now, look, a bit of an assist from uh, Firmin himself, uh, getting himself a long lap pen. Took it well. <laughs> Didn't crash this time. Firmin Aldeguer. I mean, we're all like, oh, is there, you know, doubt for Ducati now? He's not looking as amazing as he was last season. All that stuff. But the end of the day, he's thrown all, like he's been winning in winning positions several times. And it's just, he's made mistakes. He's made the, uh, and not big, not big mistakes. Like just getting it like a, a track limits infringement. And we hate the track limits. We didn't talk about it with Maverick either earlier. So that happened, but yeah, track limits, which we hate the solution. Of course, as we always say here on Rob GP is grass. Gets himself a track limits penalty, long lap, falls back behind Agura and Garcia and then stays in the hunt, challenges for the win in the end. But uh, I mean, it was brilliant viewing this last lap. Garcia dropped off. His tyres went two laps too early, unlucky. The other two tyres started to go right at the end and the last couple of laps, especially the last lap, just watching those bikes moving around and these lads just like, looked like they were an inch from the gravel every corner, just like the slightest little 1% of input on the throttle or extra, you know, 1% too much on the on the trail braking and it looked like they were going to go. It was, oh my God, the sun's bloody come out and it overexposed me. There we go. Sun's out, lads. That's new. And anyway, they looked like they were on the edge of the whole last lap and, and Iger looked like he just had that fraction more tyre come to the last sort of, the last lap basically uh, and was able to put it all together, get a tiny gap to uh, 
you know, half a second to Fermin and just hold it. And brilliant race, brilliant race. And it leaves us in an interesting position here. Agura goes ahead of Roberts, obviously, who can't compete at the moment. Uh, disappointing for him. Now, you'd have to think Aldeguer's too far away to make an impact now with how good Garcia and Agura look. Uh, but you never know. With a guy of his quality, he might go on a four-race winning streak. So who knows, right? It can happen with him. But he's fifth in the World Championship. Agura closes the gap to Garcia. This is going to be a great battle for the rest of the season. I'm really looking forward to it. It's nice seeing Agura genuinely, genuinely challenging at the front. And I think as much as he'll say, you know, oh, I don't want to move up until I win Moto2 Championship and oh, I want to move up to the right bike and maybe he doesn't want the – mate, you are going up next season. I, there's no way they're not convincing this lad to go up. Even if he doesn't win the World Championship in Moto2 next this season, he wants to stay another year and he doesn't want the Takanaka seat. Mate, you're getting it. You're having it. <laughs> they're not going to let you not have it, all right? Um, but great race. I really enjoyed it. A really good last lap or last couple of laps. Uh, any shout outs I want to make here? Let's have a look. Uh, my boy Senna. I thought he grabbed the top 10, but he's 11th. Ah, well. Chantra was awesome. Jake Dixon, nice little return to form for him. Tony Albolino ran around at the front of the field for ages. Good race by him. Good to see him back as well. Moto3. I only watched this one this morning. <laughs> it's Wednesday, by the way. Uh, only watched this one this morning. This was awesome. And your heart breaks for Colin Vire at his home Grand Prix. Uh, but I think as much as Vire was incredible, I mean, as much as uh, Ivan Altola was incredible to pull back the time in the last two laps, this was a one, this was a race lost, I think, by Vire. I think he tightened up. Maybe there was technical things. I didn't hang around in the post-race to see anything. I haven't read anything in the meantime. But this, just on in initial viewing, it looked like just that the lad tightened up a bit and yeah, it can happen. He's a young man. Nerves home Grand Prix. I think if he's any other country in the world, he just goes on and wins that because the pressure's not there to to hold on. You know, you probably don't want it as bad as that. Yeah, unlucky for him there. But it was a really good race. We had a big league group that we were threatening to drop a few. There's maybe three at the back that you could say were a different group. The I'm going to call it the Kelso group, but it all went a bit chaotic at the end. Kurosato running off. Alonso got beat up a bit, which we don't normally see. Uh, David Mignoff. My God, them two going in on each other in those last few laps. Just like literally just, I'm just going to run into the side of him. That was it. I'm just going to run into the side of him and make the corner. I don't care what happens to him. Them two were just going at each other. Moreda picked up a fourth in all the chaos. Lynetta ended up sixth in all of that as well. There was just, it was just all happening. Picaris, shout out. Pole position. Well done. Couldn't quite keep up in the race there, but did a decent job. It was all very good. Olgado loses a stack of points here again. And you'd have to say Vi is probably the big threat now for David Alonso. Where's Ortola? 105 points. He's still there or thereabouts if he can keep this up. But yeah, they're still a long way back from Alonso. It's just he'll probably just go on to do this all. So he'll win a few more races, probably more than a few more. Um, and yeah, Colin Vire, I think, will come second in the World Championship. But watch out for Otola. Danny Olgado's gone off the boil, but we'll see. Hopefully, he can gain that back. It was a good weekend of racing. I really enjoyed the racing. Pecco made it a bit boring at the front of that one. But there was good racing throughout the field, I thought. And there was bit, plenty of drama. Um, and my God, the sun has come out. And you know what? While we get a day where it looks like it won't rain for an afternoon for the first time in ages, um, I'm going to wrap this up quickly get this one through the edit and I'm actually going to go wash my bike while it actually looks like it's not going to rain. So see you after Germany.